ఎందుకంటే కనెక్ట్ ఉంది నా గుర్తు గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ అండ్ అ వెరీ వార్మ్ వెల్కమ్ టు ఆల్ ఆఫ్ యు టు దిస్ ఆన్లైన్ ఈవెంట్ దిస్ ఇస్ సెషన్ 11 of the series of uh, poi- of events on indian poetry past present and future which the intercultural poetry and performance library has been uh, conducting uh, since the pandemic forced us to go online the intercultural poetry and performance library is located in calcutta but we do have a bombay chapter as well a mumbai chapter as well and uh, we uh, before we uh, the pandemic came into our lives and disrupted everything we functioned from the library premises of the iccr in kolkata and uh, we were working towards setting up a poetry library in the premises of the iccr we had uh, conducted quite a number of book donation events and uh, we were working towards it till things went um, for a toss completely we ha- we have also uh, been regularly conducting events uh, various kinds of events on poetry on translation and we are not just looking at uh, translations or at poetry written in english but in all languages we have had lots of performance events a- as well at iccr and since we've gone online um, you know we've been doing it on the virtual space and we've been streaming our events live on our facebook page uh, the ippl as we call it uh, uh, has also been organizing book launches uh, both in the physical space at the iccr and we've just resumed our online book launches for members uh, a few months ago where we had uh, we just had two of our members launch their uh, volumes of poetry so and we have a very active whatsapp group that is only for members where we have been trying to stay connected throughout the pandemic and uh, where we've been uh, sharing a poetry prompts on every sunday and we've had um, members respond to those poetry prompts and it gives me great pleasure to let everyone who's joined here today know that we've been uh, collecting and collating these poems and uh, into uh, an anthology which is in its final stages of publication so this is the first ippl anthology that we are bringing out and this is uh, poems which members have written in response to sunday prompts uh, since last year april april or may so we've been very active uh, there and i think uh, poetry has kept us connected maybe even kept us sane and going um, throughout this uh, period for those of you who don't know i am nishi pulogurtha and i am the secretary of ippl i'm also one of the coordinators of this event with uh, dr joydeep sharungi uh, joydeep is the vice president of ippl and without much ado i would like to begin um this evening's program so i will introduce we have a panel discussion and i will introduce um uh, first shanjukta di professor shanjukta dashgupta who does not need any introduction uh, she is uh, the president of the intercultural poetry and performance library and uh, she is one of the most enthusiastic and active members of IPPL uh, she's constantly there encouraging and and I, i for one can say that i couldn't work without shanjukta di there because i know she's always going to be there <coughs> she is the driving force of IPPL and uh, she is also the convener of the english board of shahitya academy new delhi professor dashgupta was dean of arts and professor in the department of english university of calcutta Uh, she has several awards and achievements to her credit and she is an eminent poet in her own right a short story writer and a critic so shantukta di is going to moderate this evening session so i would like to formally welcome shantukta di i would then go on to introduce uh, djv 
uh, GJV Prasad, formerly professor of English at uh, JNU. Uh, he's also a poet, a novelist, and a translator. And uh, his teaching and research have focused on various aspects of Indian English literature. And um, as I said, he's a poet, so we will be talking about some of his works as well, as, and also about Indian English poetry. Uh, his latest uh, works are a translation of Ambai stories uh, called A Red-Necked Green Bird and another volume, a recent volume of poems called This World of Mine. Welcome, GJV. We look forward to hearing you speak. I would like to next invite Anjum Hassan. Anjum is a novelist and a short story writer. Her latest book is A Day in the Life. I would now request uh, my co-coordinator, Joydeep Sharangi, uh, to um, introduce the other panelists of this evening. Joy Good Deep. evening. Good evening. And uh, IPPL uh, means is synonymous with poetry and events related to poetry. Uh, we have with us the galaxy of the great uh, critics and poets, novelists of the nation who made India proud of. Those who have been following Indian writing in English for the last uh, four decades or so, I think uh, the, all the panelists are known to them uh, uh, by, every, um, by every means. We have been following since our making days as a, as a critic, as a scholar, uh, Professor Asaduddin, Professor Shamla Narayan, Professor Jizebe Prasad, and of course, Professor Shangjukta Dash Gupta. And we are very honored that we have with us Anjum, uh, and uh, there will be two persons who will be reading Jizebe's uh, poems uh, from their heart. Let me introduce uh, Professor Asaduddin. Professor Asaduddin needs no introduction because uh, you know, of her enormous areas of work that he has engaged with. Former professor of English, advisor to vice chancellor, ac academic, uh, and uh, is a very renowned professor of Jamia Melia Islamia, noted critic. And always Professor Asaudin comes to my, um, our mind for his enormous contribution on Prem Chand. And his book on Prem Chand, Random House, is, is just amazing work for, uh, for all the scholars to read. Charles Wallace Fellow, Fulbright Fellow, a scholar, and many more to come. But another very important thing about Professor Asaudin that uh, inspires always is a uh, his role as a, as a translator. He is a, one of the major leading translators of the country, Katha Averdi, Shaitya Academy Translation Award, Crossword, Book Averdi, and what more. And is the chair, Ayakals, and uh, Ayakals is the home for all intellectual minds in India. So, Professor Asaudin, welcome to IPPL. We are looking forward to hearing from you. We have with us another person who has closely collaborated with uh, Professor M. K. Nayak and uh, co-authored two very important uh, books and sequel. And uh, I just uh, was mentioning how now anchored in Bangalore, a noted critic of Indian writing in English and Indian writing in, in English is absolutely uh, is uh, nothing without Professor Shamla Narayan. It's compiling to the Indian section of Indian bibliography of Commonwealth literature. And we, we are astonished to the kind of energy that she brings into it and how come she can make it so minute details of publications uh, of, uh, of uh, the bibliographical details and really Indian writing in English in, is enriched by her uh, enormous contribution to this. And uh, of course, she is, she is also a word of different uh, prestigious awards. Her reviews, articles appeared, featured in prestigious journals in different continents. And in uh, Indian English Literature 2001 to 2015, a critical survey published in 2020 is one of her landmark studies. 
Professor Shamla Narayan. Welcome to IPPL. And uh, you inspire us always to work hard for Indian writing in English. Over to Nishikula Gupta. Uh, thank you so much, Joydeep. We now uh, begin the uh, panel discussion, and I would request Sean Juktadi to please moderate the session. Uh, we'll have questions and answer, question answer session after all the panelists have spoken. And I would request everyone who is not speaking to please mute yourselves to keep your audios on mute. Sean Juktadi. Thank you, Nishi. That was a very generous introduction. And hello, everyone. As all of us realize, this is an evening of great joy for us at IPPL. As we have this fantastic opportunity of welcoming on our IPPL platform some of the brightest stars of our intellectual and creative worlds. I am hesitating to use professor as a, uh, is it a joyful outcry? <laughs> Couldn't get it, all right. So Prasad, who is a poet friend and I today I'm dropping the professor uh, from uh, just addressing him. Shamla Narayan, whom I haven't met for a long time, but I remember all the time and Malashrilal and I talk about you a lot, Shamla. Professor Asaduddin, of course, Asad also is a good friend. We meet occasionally at the Saiti Academy. And novelist uh, and poet Anjum Hassan, though we have not met, I know your work and I'm so proud that you, you are with us this evening. And also our young poet friend, Somrita, who will be reading along with Shoptaparna, who is a member of the IPPL. The central star in the horizon this evening, of course, is Prasad's new book of about 100 pages with a very challenging and provocative title, though it seems so innocuous, This World of Mine. We have the great advantage this evening of hearing Prasad talk about his book, as we have the privilege of hearing our distinguished speakers talk about Prasad's book. And also we have the privilege of hearing uh, Prasad's poems read by our um, very young poets like uh, Shomrita and Shaktaparna, the poems in his new book, This World of Mine. The title of Prasad's book, This World is Mine, I feel emphasizes possessiveness, world of mind, intimacy and emotional intelligence. The third embedded deeply at the core of each poem. None of the poems are epical in length. In fact, they are often rather short and oscillates between explosion and implosion. We cannot fail but notice the role playing of the poet in a world that to him is exhilarating, enigmatic, eccentric, cryptic, violent, hypocritical, vindictive, and also glorious. Quite remarkably, the binaries and hemispheres are presented in a spherical mode of inclusive humanism, which is the USP of Prasad's book. Remember those lines from Shakespeare's play as you like it, I'm sure all of you know what those lines, all the world's a stage, all of us had to learn that by heart, I think. And all the men and women merely players, they have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Now Prasad's world is not restricted to seven ages. Prasad's poetic world is multivalent. It resonates with infinite variety ranging from Sati and Draupadi to partition and whatsappery. I would now like to invite the star poet of the evening, GJV Prasad, to tell us about his book, This World of Mine, and read a few of his poems. Over to you, the poet of This World is Mine. 
Thank you very much. That was, it was so <laughs> wonderful to Thank you. Uh, listen to you speak of my book. Uh, I'm always, what can I say, hesitant. I'm a hesitant poet, all right? Uh, I've always thought of myself as a poet, but I've always thought nobody else would think of me as a poet. So I wrote poetry when I was in school, I published in the children's world, but I would be very hesitant to show it to people. And uh, I've written throughout my life, but I've never ever published you know, as much, published my poems. Um, I published a few here and there. This is my second collection. The second collection coming after 25 years after my first collection in Delhi without a visa. And, uh, and this is too is a selected poems volume. I have some poems for the first volume also in this. Um, it's just that I, I, I'm a kind of poet where, uh, who, who reacts to events around him, to people around him. Uh, I said somewhere the other day that we, I grew up uh, in literary studies at a time when the personal being political, the personal is political was a slogan which was growing in strength. And for me, the political was always personal. And I said this, and I mean, I don't know how I got muted. Um, I see myself as a political poet more than anything else. Uh, I write, I react to even, as I said, to put the pol political events around me, to social events that happen, which are political in nature, really. And in that sense, I also see the personal as political. And I'm aware that when I write personal poetry, it too is about society at large. Uh, and I'm not just me, I'm a number of other people, etc. So I, the only thing that, as I said, is that I, I said I'm a hesitant poet because I, I've read so many poets. As a teacher, you teach poetry, you read poetry, and you see greatness in others. And you see what being poetic actually means. And, uh, you know, reading Sanjukta's poetry, for example, the other day I was reading through a book, latest book, and I was thinking, ah, she's a poet. <laughs> and I, I read my poetry and I don't say, ah, this is poetry. Uh, so there is a difference. Uh, I'm not so much into form in the same way that, I, that good poets are. Um, I'm not into striking imagery in the same way. I, 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 I just say things and I say things in what I think are poems. Uh, let's put it like that. And uh, my, my favorite poet for a very long time, the two favorite poets were Nisim Ezekiel and Eunice D'Souza and they wrote short poems and uh, they, they, they wrote ironically and I think that's part of what's influenced me a lot. Um, a poet of my generation who's very different from me, who I always loved and who did not write enough, according to me, uh, is, um, oh God, I'll come back to this. I'll come back to this. Uh, Nambisan, Vijay Nambisan. Okay, I got the word name. Suddenly the name slipped out of my mind. Uh, Vijay Nambisan. Vijay Nambisan's poetry is, again, fabulous. When I read Vijay for the first time, uh, I said, there are people who write like this. He's so good. He's so good, right? So when I write, read poets of my generation, and there's so many, I mean, there's so many poets I can name around me writing right now, uh, younger than me, the next generation, and they all write so well that I, as I said, I kind of hesitate. Yesterday, I think it was a district that Adil Jasawala said he wanted to be invisible. Uh, I sometimes want my poems to be invisible. Uh, so it's not so much that uh, the poet should be invisible. I think poetry should be invisible at times. Uh, so I'm not being an unduly modest. I'm just saying why I say these things, why I say these things. But I always felt I was saying significant things. It is significant to me and people around me that I was reacting to events which were of great significance to us, that I was somebody who was in and out of all that was happening around me that I could judge, I could talk about, but I got to also see how much I was part of it. Right. So in that sense, I, I always felt that uh, people who read my poems, who like them uh, and who react to them, I mean, I, I, could, I could see that they see the same significance that I see. 
of course listening to sanjukta today i felt that uh, oh wow i mean i'm that i'm that i mean it made me it, it gave me a certain sense of validity uh, and and you know more than i expected uh, having said that i should say that i have had some very very good readers over the years and uh, there are two people and if you don't like this book of mine the, which is this world of mine there are two people you can blame immediately and both of them are on this panel one is shamla shamla narayan and the other is asad asaduddin uh, the two of them kept telling me that i should publish that i should publish that i had you know should not worry about whether i had enough poems or not with that i wanted to show the world just publish some you know publish a book publish a book write your poetry and uh, i and my poems which have been published which uh, come into this book and even unpublished ones were all written uh, when people asked me to write when people asked me for poems and i wrote them and some of course i could not help writing because like for example uh, about justice about the judge who said those things uh, about what's happening uh, so these poems i had to write i mean how else could could i how could i not write and ultimately finally this is what i want to say about my poetry my poems are written and the poems in the book and the poems in the previous book um, they were written because what else could i do this is the only way i could react to what was happening around me this is what i had to write because this world of mine needs to be reacted to actively and this is the only way i know how to react i think i should stop here thanks Prasad, we would like you to read a few poems to set the tone of the evening, and then I will ask Shamla to I respond to your book. I don't know what the what the other two people who the two people are going to read for my poetry. I don't know what they're going to read, and so I didn't know. I didn't want to preempt. Okay, uh, how about reading uh, those four lines from your po uh, poem, which is uh, titled "Poetry." Ah, okay. This is on page eighty-seven. Yeah, I should find that. For once, I'm a little organized. Yes. <laughs> I could well have said eighty-seven, and when it was twenty-seven. Right. You know, uh, this has always surprised me about poetry, right? And and my my relationship, people's relationship with poetry, poetry. why does poetry make so much sense to me when i never know what the poets mean why does poetry give me so much energy when it takes so much effort to read poetry takes effort to read it does and uh, but poetry is so beautiful poetry is so energizing uh, and so meaningful and yet so difficult to make to find the meaning to be certain that you read it correctly this to be certain this is it's a, it's an interesting genre it's it's one of the most uh, it's a beautiful genre as i said uh, and as someone who reads a lot and who doesn't consider himself to be as great a poet as most others as good a poet as good a poet as most others i must say that i find the way they control the pace i find the way uh, you know how the words the echo how they resonate how they come together how the images work and yet it 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 repays you when you read it like read the poems like that closely it, it repays you so well and yet it's so difficult to be sure of yourself and be certain that you read correctly and that you're making correct making sense so this poem tells you what i think of poetry and uh, i'm not that kind of poet i'm very simple to read and you can make sense of what i'd say and i would request you to read one more and we go on to shamla and this is on page 76 post trauma that is the quintessential prasad irony humor wit and the rest the poem will tell you <laughs> <laughs> post trauma sometimes life is a dog's bad teeth and bounding energy who can know its smile from its snarl life is interpretation of god's will 
in dog's deed. <laughs> and you can do that Brilliant. Brilliant. It's Brilliant. Oh. So, <laughs> all right. Now we will go on to our first panelist for this evening after the poet and a panelist who, as Prasad just said, is very familiar with the poems of Prasad and has also urged him to publish his poems. And that is Shamla Narayan. And I'm so happy that Shamla has been able to join us this evening. And Shamla, would you like to respond to Prasad's bo book of poems? The second one, the first one, I think he published way back, almost a 25 year gap, though in between he was writing a lot of poems. But um, Prasad's uh, latest book, the one we are going to discuss today, The World is Mine. Oh, thank you, Sanyukta, for your warm words. So uh, to go back to Vijayan Ambition, I feel he's probably uh, the best poet of that generation. And I like him very much because he's so conscious of the rhythm of the lines. See, far too many, I mean, uh, uh, to some extent, I disagree with uh, Prasad. I'm talking about other poets, not his poems. I'm talking about his comments. Uh, when he said, uh, that, uh, you know, he seems to uh, think that all poetry uh, seems to repay reading. But I'm sorry to say that the bulk of modern poetry seems to be just, you know, uh, to echo words, words, words out of context. It's just an overflowing emotion. And you'll have poems, poets will write a whole poem in two word lines. And however long you may read it, you will not be able to get any music out of it. So this is uh, very different from the poets worth reading. And there are, of course, a number of poets who are really worth reading. See, what I like most about uh, Prasad's poetry and some other poets of his generation is that they are so conscious of the society around them. I mean, the poems are not, uh, they're just about themselves and their personal angst. I mean, it's about, the, that's a, a very appropriate title. He, he calls it the world of mine. So he writes about the world of ours. I mean, something we can all relate to. And uh, so uh, what I like most about his uh, poems is that uh, unfortunately, you know, I feel that the second collection, it seems to have a much, what should I say, a much more uh, somber note than his first. Maybe because the situation in India has changed, or maybe that he no longer has the enthusiasm of youth, which would have, which must have fueled his first collection. Anyway, I'm very happy that he has uh, reprinted uh, one of my favorite poems that's in a Delhi without a visa. He has, uh, Prasad has the art of dealing with very serious issues in a comic mode. I mean, if you look, at, uh, if you read this poem, it's about an intensely serious issue of what we could call internal migration. But he, completely the, uh, but for the title, which is very serious, you know, he calls it Desperately Seeking India. Uh, the rest of the poem maintains the comic mode. Uh, but I find the, uh, the tone in this uh, collection, on the whole, most of the poems are more somber. And of course, the, the same uh, sense of humor along with very hard hitting satire. You know, if you look at a poem like this, for example, uh, you have this election strategies, shining India. In a way, it's a 
a somewhat a saddening poem because it sums up the current situation so correctly. And uh, all the time, the irony is there at play. It begins, I woke up one day to see India shining. And the paper said so in bold that morning, cleansed of those who had kept India pining. And then he makes very effective use of uh, rhyme, you know. We have unleashed the Hindu ride tide. We have restored the Hindu pride. We have saved the Hindu bride. So this in just a few words, it sums up the current situation. How, uh, you know, Hinduism is being used or misused just for election purposes. Of course, there are many poems which are not so, uh, shall I say, saddening or serious. Uh, there are two poems which I feel, you know, they tend to be what I would call a sort of in-joke, very enjoyable poems, uh, but it's only for the, uh, what should I say, selected audience. This is the two writers at JNU. I think it's uh, one of the best lighter poems uh, that I've read in recent years. And uh, at the same time, it has, a, it ends on a serious note. You know, how uh, the administrative staff has absolutely no idea about poetry or its values. And uh, when he is told, and we can all guess who, who the senior poet is, so he is told, he is asking the poet, what do you do for a living? And he says, and uh, Prasad or the speaker says, he's a senior officer in the police, I said. The rector choked in laughter. And after some water and pats on the back, he straightened up and said, jokes apart, what do you really do, he asked. So the humor is there, but at the same time, it's a comment on the social situation. And then we have got some poems uh, with the references to, uh, you know, mythology. For example, Mother's Day. So with the um, uh, taking up the story of uh, Lord Krishna, he seems to, you know, indirectly take up the whole issue of surrogate motherhood, which is a topic under much uh, discussion because they haven't yet, you know, fully uh, you know, framed the rules to cover it. And there's a lot of controversy. So this takes up a theme from mythology and, you know, goes on to uh, cast light on a, a very real 21st century problem. Uh, which uh, this reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, uh, to stray from Prasad's book. See, I was uh, reading uh, the Tisu Brahmanyam's When God is a Traveler. And I still haven't worked out how she won the Sahit Academy Award, unless the, uh, maybe they have changed the rules. Because earlier, when I used to be uh, on the jury, I think uh, some 70%, 75% of the book had to be newly published. Here I find there are 20 poems published earlier and 29 poems uh, newly published in 2014. So how does she get the 2020 Sahit Academy Award? Because that should be covering the years 2015 to 2019, you know, five years worth. So I'm, uh, maybe uh, they've changed the rules in the Sahit Academy, I don't know. See, I, I, I feel very much for it on this issue because years ago, when uh, C.D. Narasimha's uh, book, a collection of essays, was on the short list, we found that only 50% of the essays were new. So he, uh, he was not given the award. And that year, the award did not go to anybody because we couldn't agree on the other books. So here she says, I know I'm digressing from uh, Prasad's book, 
but I feel only by comparison, we can sort of, you know, fully appreciate the Prasad's achievement. She says, the title poem is, When God is a Traveler. And she says, wandering about Kartikeya, Murga, Supramanya, my namesake. See, the very first line puts me out because no girl is called Subramanya. Her name is Arundhati, and Subramanya must be a, a convenient second name, perhaps a patronymic. And then uh, she says, trust the God back from his travels, his voice whole grain and chamomile, his wisdom name. And somehow I cannot uh, relate chamomile with Lord Subramanya. No doubt it's possible, but then the poet should have built up the link. I mean, I can understand a uh, sort of uh, synesthetic effect she's trying to create, but then she could have, uh, you know, selected some other fragrance. Why chamomile, which seems to be very foreign to. Anyway, uh, I get back to uh, Prasad. I find that many of the poets of his uh, generation, I mean, the better poets are very conscious of the social situation. See, uh, another collection of uh, poems uh, that I uh, really liked was uh, uh, Tabish Kher's response uh, to the pandemic. So he has this uh, collection of uh, sonnets written in imitation of Shakespeare. And he gets the exact, uh, the structure exactly right, but he adapts it uh, for comic purposes and also for satire. He has a number of speakers. I mean, uh, uh, the, shall I say, the persona reciting the poem. Uh, you have uh, rich people, you have the poor uh, person trekking home, which reminds me again of, uh, you know, uh, Prasad's, uh, what I call a rather saddening poem about the long march, the last in this selection. And you find that Prasad's poem, The Long March, it's not just about the people affected by the pandemic. It's more about the reaction of the privileged people. It says, there they were on the roads, all over the place and dying where they wished. Why can they be herded properly? Anchors asked. Why no arrangements had been made, food and shelter for the night and water and loose. Not that they needed clean toilets. They would dirty them soon, even if some of them cleaned ours. You know, this uh, uh, a very uh, superior attitude of the privileged class that is brought out beautifully. Anyway, I think I've taken up enough time. I must uh, let the other panelists have their say. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Shamila. That was a very incisive uh, mm. understanding of Prasad's poetry. We have learned a lot about how to read poetry and what to expect in poetry. And it has been very enriching your interventions and also your reading of uh, the lines of his poems. And now I would like to invite Anjum Hassan, who is a novelist, a poet, an editor, a short story writer, and is probably a full-time writer rather than uh, like most of us who are such boring with our pedagogic uh, professions, which is all about teaching. So from the pedagogue to the full-time poet, Anjum Hassan, uh, you, I, we would be interested in knowing your responses to Prasad's poetry and to this particular book of poems. Thank you so much, uh, Sanyukta. And uh, 
It was very interesting to listen to Prasad and Shamala before this. Um, uh, in different ways, I think both of them spoke about the political element in this collection. Uh, and that really interested me very much, uh, not the political, just a subject matter, but like Prasad said, the uh, political as personal and vice versa. And the question of how does the poet do that? How does the poet pull that off? Uh, before that, I, I just want to say that I was really charmed by many of the poems here simply because the tone is so refreshing. Um, and I think uh, in an era where um, there is a sense of gravitas uh, and ponderousness about poetry, uh, it's very nice that it's very nice to get to read a poet who neither takes poetry too seriously nor himself. I think that was, to me, that was uh, the most charming thing about uh, about many of the poems in this in this collection. Uh, I particularly liked uh, the first couple of poems, uh, which are a little more autobiographical. Uh, I thought Desperately Seeking India was a wonderful manifesto for many of us uh, who don't quite, within quotes, belong uh, anywhere very specific. Um, I, I, I think that, that that's really a poem that should be read very widely. Um, and I really also liked the family poem. Uh, I think Prasad is able to compress. Uh, there's a wonderful gift of compression here because he's actually talking about a moment of reckoning, uh, a sort of a very uh, um, epiphanic moment, one could say, where he, he says that that was the night my childhood died and my gods haven't survived. Uh, that is the conclusion of the poem, but it's a very playful, wonderful poem, again on the theme of what it means to be an Indian or a Hindu, or, uh, or, or let's say, um, within quotes, mainstream. Um, and I use the word stream uh, knowingly because it's, it is about rivers and our cultural relationship to rivers. So I, I enjoyed, particularly enjoyed these poems uh, in the collection that are, um, that are personal at an angle. They are not straightforward retellings of autobiography, but they are, they use draw in autobiography to make uh, often ironical, often, um, mischievous, uh, often charming sort of points. Uh, and I thought the, the mention of Vijay Nambison was very apt here because he's, he's very, very good at this, uh, of telling it slant. Uh, I have to apologize for the fireworks. I'm uh, in Madikeri and uh, it's this festival, uh, very important harvest festival, which they used to celebrate, but now they celebrate by blasting crackers so <laughs> apologies for the sound yeah i just wanted to add uh, one other point um to go back to what i said at the beginning about the political uh reading these poems i was asking myself how does Lectures. poetry or literature in general uh, address the political because like Prasad said, he's very much writing about his time, about his society, about the world that we live in, uh, which is the world that we all live in and none of us can really ignore. And I think sometimes it's possible to do that in a way that becomes a little more pedagogical in the sense that it's there seems to be a moral at the end of the story or the poem. Um, <laughs> And I, to me, that mode is a little less effective than the kind of, you know, telling it slant in Emily Dickinson's phrase, coming at it at an angle. 
uh, that mode. And I can see both modes at work here. Uh, I thought, for instance, the Sati sequence, there's a sequence of three poems on Sati, there are poems on Godra, there's a poem at the end uh, that um, Shamala just mentioned on, on, on the Long March um, that workers undertook in the aftermath of the pandemic and so on. So very many of these are sort of familiar political events, catastrophes, whatever you would call it. And sometimes the poems seem to be just performing that pedagogical function of, of uh, you know, noting the, the writers or the poets protest or discomfort with, with that. Maybe dr dramatizing it, yes, dramatizing it, perhaps like in the Sati poems through a story, through a semi-fictional mode. But still, one gets the feeling that it's a very, it's a very familiar, it's a very familiar response, and it's not, it's not as if the response is unwelcome. But the question remain in my mind is how do we make this new? How how do we make the political new in poetry in a way that really makes us sit up and and question what's going on? So registering the protest, re registering the discomfort is important, I think. But I still felt that the poems that made it even more personal uh, were more effective for me. And I think for me, the example that really worked uh, in this respect is a poem called 31st October 1984. And... Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm sure you know which poem I'm talking about. The title is just the date and we don't really need to know anything else. Uh, and he says, I watched him burn. That's how the poem starts. And immediately it swerves to talk about something else altogether, which is a personal story um, of somebody else burning, a, a friend or a relative. The other time I watched someone burn, he was dead already. And then there's a very uh, marvelous, I thought, um, description of funerals, nothing about riots, nothing about politics. And then we come back to this subject only in the last stanza where he says he had stopped shrieking long ago and the mob raced after another victim as an American TV cameraman filmed the corpse for posterity and breakfast TV. So I think this sort of, what I was saying earlier, the gift for compression really works really well here because we don't need to, we all already know the story. What, what we want is the very telling image, the indelible image. And that is curiously, that is sometimes better evoked when you do it from very very far away you know you do it uh you don't you don't have a sort of a frontal attack on the subject but you come at it from a distance and from an angle um there's another poem which is also i think a very good example of this uh technique that i'm trying to talk about it's called all abhimanyus and again we don't need to know the story right we all know it so this, the poems where the, the cultural references are already shared, the, the political history is already shared, and you are presenting us with a sort of distilled image. I thought those poems were very, very, very much more effective. But this again is, is just a poem of five lines, and it has nothing, no direct reference to the Mahabharat except in the title. And so it becomes metaphor because you say wildly the pigeons fluttered into the pain that still divides though you may see afar. It beat its head in vain. Once in a glass house, you had better learn to throw stones or bear the inner heat. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a wonderful way of making a metaphor out of Abhimanyu without needing to write a moral you know, a poem that has a specific morality or a moral at the end of it. So, so yeah, I think this this really made me think about even, I, I guess this is a question all of us ask as writers who are trying to write about the present. 
how do we do it in a way that, um, like Calvino said, Calvino has this wonderful essay about the right and wrong political uses of literature. And it's very much about this. How do we, um, how can we make literature more than either a private consolation, you know, aesthetic beauty, or be just a rehearsal of uh, political values that we already share. Uh, when I say we, I mean the likely readers of a book like this, uh, certain uh, 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 milieu, people in a particular milieu which shared values. Uh, and of course, that is not to say that everyone shares those values, but I don't think, I'm not sure that poetry can pull off that pedagogical role. And so it works better when, when the um, the art is more cunning, I think. And so I was I was glad that I found poems which where the art is actually quite cunning. So thanks a lot. That's uh, that's what I wanted to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Anju, for once again a very uh, insightful reading of the poems. And you have also identified a number of poems which were not referred to earlier. And, uh, and each poem uh, is a sort of a nugget of reflection. And also at the same time, it is about what we are experiencing all around us, but it moves much beyond that. And that is what a role of a poet should be. And as Prasad already, as soon as he we asked him to talk, uh, make his um, first introductory comments about his book, he uh, referred to the personal is the political, taking our, taking the slogan of the women's liberation movement of the late 60s. And I'm so glad that there are a number of which I would claim to be feminist poems in his book because they are quite uncompromising uncom in his uh, understanding of the sort of uh, gender discrimination and gender injustice that goes on in our country. And also since we have been talking about the political, Anjum also repeatedly talked about the political, and you know, I too wanted to refer to a few of that uh, while introducing the panelists, but I couldn't find them. Now I have. <laughs> so I, before I ask um, uh, Asaduddin uh, Asad, as we call him, to uh, tell us about his responses to Prasad's poetry, and since we have talked about the political, I want to just read out a few quotes. One is by Allen Ginsberg, who says that poetry is not an expression of the party line. It's that time of night, lying in bed, thinking what you really think, making the private world public. That's what the poet does. And then somebody whom we do not know as a poet at all is Salman Rushdie. And he comments on the poet's work saying, the poet's work to name the unnameable to point at frauds, to take sides, start arguments, shape the world and stop it from going to sleep. And the last one that I just want to read is by, again, we do not know him as uh, too much of a poet as such, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And this is what he had to say about literature as a whole. Literature that is not the breath of contemporary society, that dares not transmit the pains and fears of that society, that does not warn in time against threatening moral and social dangers. Such literature does not deserve the name of literature. It is only a facade. And for the rest of that quote, you have to read it up on Google because it's a little derogatory. Yes? So on that note, I will ask uh, Asad, Muhammad Asaduddin, to tell us about his responses to his friend Prasad's poetry. And he also was one of those friends who just 
prevailed on him to publish. Uh, thank you, Sanjukta. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, I'm asking you because I'm sitting in a remote village of Assam. I just got a lamppost where there is a bit of network. Oh. And if I turn on my video, that I, I lose that network. But so, uh, good, you, good. Yeah. So you're more like a poet out there. Yes, <laughs> yes. under a lamppost, <laughs> trying to get some sort of uh, waves coming into your phone so that you can yeah. <laughs> talk to you, us. Yeah, you, you, so, could, you could say yeah, so. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, good evening, friends, colleagues, poetry lovers. Uh, poetry is shared among friends and uh, I was delighted to hear the impression of uh, several panelists who came before me. And particularly the last one, perhaps this is how a poet can talk about another poet because she has gone through the same process. I will give my mundane impression of the poems. I find these poems extremely enjoyable simple, uncomplicated, but these are within quotes. A poem is never simple. There are subtexts and subtexts. And then what Shamla has pointed out that they are not narcissistic indulgences, but extremely engaged poems, extremely courageous poems, extremely relevant and topical poems. Anjum has singled out the first poem, Desperately Seeking India, this is one of my favorite poems as well. And I think this is a sub subtext that runs through quite a few poems. And that subtext, subtext may be described ponderously, as Anjum has pointed out, my word, as the idea of India, which I think all sensitive citizens engage with in their life, in their writings. And this poem exposes the pretensions of, of many of us who claim themselves as world citizens, cosmopolitan citizens, but are in fact prisoners of their small identities, small prejudices, small superstitions. And that is what Prasad wants to break this is my reading of quite a few of his poems, not obviously, but in a subtle way. Several poems have been discussed, but I'll single out one that has not been discussed, and that is August 1976. I think it is. it was written uh, post-emergency and when many of the prisoners were still there in prison, it also represents many of us who in extreme situation play safe, who do not resist enough, who either do not have the courage or because of our circumstances, we don't push the envelope beyond a point. And if we are sensitive, we suffer from the survivor's guilt. When we see that many of our colleagues have resisted, have resisted strongly at the cost of many things while we try to play safe, from our safe perch, we make comments on contemporary happenings. And uh, I personally share the guilt that has been described there. Anjum has mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, Sati, one, two, three, and there is a poem titled Draupadi. These poems together can encapsulate the feminist concerns and the hypocrisies of many people that are associated with those concerns. These are also poems of exposure 
exposure that lies in the uh, difference between appearance and reality, in, in between what we claim and what we practice in real life. What Sapari is another very interesting and engaging poem, very contemporary poem. When you hear these kinds of debates almost every day on television channels, this together with several other poems engage with the legal system and how that legal system op op operate, operates in India. So then the last poem, The Long March, the title has many resonances because in history, we know that there have been many long marches. And for me, these ironic resonances are very important. Uh, this particular long march, it again exposes the hollowness of Indian middle class, uh, who again from their very safe perch observe human misery with a sense of detachment and become diminished human beings because we find that the voice that describes is singularly, it describes a class that is singularly lacking in human compassion and kindness to the spectacle of an enormous scene of human misery. So for me, uh, Prasad is me, Prasad is us. In many of his poem, he describes our own anxieties, our frustrations, our disappointments with many things that are happening around us. I wish the book all the best and uh, I shared the joy of discussing them together <clears throat> and enjoying them when they are read out. Some of them have been read out already and I'm looking forward to the other young poets who read his poems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asad. Yes, I agree. This world of mine is our world. It is not only Prasad's world. And Prasad has been able to uh, awaken this feeling in all his readers in a way uh, by uh, writing in a mode which is in terms of the language used, in terms of the way in which the lines flow into each other or don't. In every way, the handling of the English language is absolutely brilliant. And as we know that wit and humor, a uh, bit of cynicism, sarcasm, all this can happen in poetry only if you have a, a fantastic control on the language. And that is what Prasad has. There is so much of absolute directness. It seems so simple and yet they are also sophisticated at the same time. Simple and sophisticated might sound like an oxymoron, but in, in poetry, sometimes it may be necessary too. So uh, the, after the panelist, Nishi, are you going to ask uh, the audience to uh, ask any questions? Is, it, uh, is the session right now or is it about reading of the poems first? No, we will take questions now in case we have, I've asked that uh, in the chat Is box. there any in question in the chat wants. box? Would you? read out if there are any no there, there aren't any questions as of now so um i would so request right people now, to join in uh, yes so in case we then we can wait and maybe you know get the reading done and then if you have questions we can come back joydeep yes yes i think prasad everybody is so overwhelmed and mesmerized by your poetry that they are thinking a little the questions will come later so let us have the readings nishi Yes, uh, Jaydeep. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Shangjuktadi. And uh, it's a very wonderful session that uh, we are engaged with, starting with Shangjuktadi's introduction, then uh, followed by Jijabi Prasad's 
own views, perceptions about poetry, and uh, to come back to his own um, writing, and writing is as political. Then to Shamla Naran, Madam, and uh, her elaborate uh, introduction and uh, insightful comments on uh, Dujevi Sahib's latest book of poetry, poems, and poetry in general. And then Anjum Hassan's uh, brilliant analysis of uh, the poetry of Prasad Ji and, uh, and how the style is very uh, contemporary and very topical and which has been highlighted again by Asad in his uh, uh, brilliant analysis of DJB Prasad's uh, latest book of poems. And uh, uh, I'm really great to see that um, poetry is uh, very colloquial, written in a very informal style and uh, it, it, the everyday language people speak about and uh, uh, the poetry, which has been, I think, a flesh and blood for every Indian. So democracy, this book of poems by Prasad is a, is, a, is a testimony to the democratization of Indian English poetry. And it is no longer uh, a kind of foreign poetry, poetry for our living totality, poetry the way we drink water, we make besan laddu, or we prepare deshi ghee. I'm referring to the beautiful poem, I think <laughs> Shangjukta Di must be, I think her uh, most, uh, you know, she is very fond of the poem title, Edible Woman. Sometime we'll write about it someday, I think definitely. And uh, before going uh, much into it, because this is a mind of uh, ex for exploration, so many things to talk about. And uh, the, the last part that I gathered from Asadda's comment, the control of a language, the language is very deshi, and deshi by means is the most important use of English as my own language. That style is, and, uh, and I hope uh, there will not be much gap between this book and the next book by Jajabi Prasad, sir, because there was a huge gap between the first book of poems and the, this book of poems. I think it will come, next book will come, and will arrive and conquer the scenario of Indian English poetry very soon. But uh, we have with us uh, two uh, important poets and uh, uh, award-winning poets, translators, who are waiting eagerly to read poems uh, from the latest collection by Jijabi Prasad Sahib. And uh, uh, let me first call uh, uh, Samrita Umi Ganguly, faculty, Head of the Department of English, Maharaja Manindra Chandra College, North of Calcutta, award winning poet and literary translator for reading two of Prasad's poems. Then we'll go come back to Shaptaparna, uh, we'll be reading two poems. Then we'll come back to Samrita again for a couple of poems for reading, and then Shaptaparna again for two poems. Over to Samrita. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Just checking, am I audible, Jadipta? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, if I look too overwhelmed today, it is because I am. Um, I'm deeply in awe of the panel we've heard over the last hour or so. Professor Asaduddin, Shamila Ji, Anjum Ji, Shonjukta Ji. Um, yet, if I'm brave enough to sit here today, it is because of the person whose uh, anthology we are discussing, um, Professor Jijavi Prasad. Uh, how Prasad has touched my life over the last decade could be, I feel it could be the subject of another discussion, another book, in fact. But that book is currently on hold because Prasad would rather have me work on my PhD thesis than a monograph on his work. Um, and that is quintessentially him, you know, the teacher who, who puts his students before himself, before anything else. I'm absolutely honored to read from Prasad's uh, latest anthology, This World of Mine. And I'll begin with one that he wrote for Steve, um, Stephanos, whom I met, I happened to meet in JNU through Prasad, including that one time, I don't know if Prasad remembers this, but that one time when he requested Steve to get Turkish delights uh, from Cyprus for me. Um, and that's the kind of 
space Prasad created for us on campus. You know, there was no shame, there was no inhibition. And this poem, I feel, um, you know, it poignantly weaves together uh, the various hats that Prasad wears. Prasad the poet, Prasad the professor, Prasad the translator, Prasad the traveler. Uh, this one's called A Poem for Stephanos. This is on page 66 for those who are following the book. A Poem for Stephanos. The world speaks in tongues written in different strokes in a register in Cyprus, in what was once a church, a mosque and a church again. All origins are in translation. I see Christ in a monastery, the color aging, a glowing dark to a pale white around the world, the world in a palette, the word in a palette, the word is translation. It is an old land of ancient peoples of myths and history, celebrating the ordinary Aphrodite among the cats, each age a translation. A Punjabi I met in the market thought he was in Cyprus, USA, though he wasn't paid in dollars, and the git pit sound, the git pit did not sound the same. He was still in some promised land. Nations are born in translation. Our origins may be across the boundaries of violence and madness. Blood may seemingly call to villages by the river and our valleys were always green. Memory is translation. People move with remembered rituals, walking on burning coals, piercing their bodies to satisfy, to thank their gods of translation. The next one um, I want to read this evening is possibly my favorite work by Prasad, a poem which I'm uh, delighted to say Prasad wrote for an anthology I edited a couple of years ago. Uh, this poem, you know, I feel this is Prasad's voice, the politics, the irony, the, the rootedness, the minimalism, you know, the subtle humor undercutting the seriousness that we've been talking about, uh, the art in this poem, as Anjum was um, saying earlier, it's delightfully cunning here. This one is called, And Anna Lakshmi Cried. It's on page 44. And Anna Lakshmi Cried, every morsel you waste adds another drop of tear to Anna Lakshmi's eyes as she mourns by the river, my grandfather said. An American friend said his mother made him eat by asking him to imagine me starving in India or Africa. But how would that have helped, I asked him, only made you bigger and stronger to put me in my place. He didn't know. He had never asked his mom and she was dead now. And in any case, this Indian didn't look like he starved ever. Maids used to bring lunch for the rich kids in class and the smell of eggs and oranges still reminds me of school, curd rice of home, while I longed for samosas and coke. We went without sugar for a year or two and rice was difficult to find, the green revolution, a distant dream, not yet a nightmare. They poured milk into the seas elsewhere and let grains rot in the fields, the same world I would think, and when they did send some across, we hated them for it. I remember when potatoes meant a feast. We were the privileged ones whose dustbins others would forage and envy. The one who got more snatching it from dogs. Source locally, they say, sustainability, they intone, where there is clean water and fertile fields, some can do so, because they can. Others will do as ever, because they can't. Thank you. Over to you, Samrita, yeah. We are basking in the delight of poetry. And we have with us uh, great poets as well, like Lakshmi Kannan, and we have uh, Professor Anand Lal here. And the audience uh, is a galaxy. But before going to the audience, uh, let's move on to Dr. Sh uh, Professor Shaptaparna Roy of Heritage Institute of Technology 
she uh, as a poet translator and over to you Shaptabana. yeah Shaptabana, you will have to unmute Shaptabana. unmute her video has gone blank as yeah. well she was smiling so much yes. and now when she <laughs> Shaptaparna? hello. There might be some issues with yes. her. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, please. yeah, please, please. Please, we please switch on your see you. as well. Please, yeah, sure. Shaptaparna, go ahead. Uh, my, my video is on, but I believe there is a network lag. Okay, no problem, yeah. A very good evening to the signature of um, today's discussion, Professor DJV Prasad, the distinguished panelists, honorable chair, the coordinators, and of course, the members of the audience. Am I clearly audible? Yes, Saptaparna, yes, please, please. Okay. Ah, you're visible okay. also Thank now. Uh, it is an absolute, okay. Thank you for confirming. Uh, it is an absolute honor for me to read from GJV Sir's latest collection of poems, This World of Mine. The first poem that I will present is entitled Saturday Morning Ritual. Relieved of the weight of the jewelry, I haven't bought you. Head soaked in oil, my wife, you wait for my first faux pas of the day. Being male and a husband, for me, there is no escape. <laughs> the second piece is titled Starbucks. The frappy foams, laughter of an office anecdote. Shy smiles of a first, shall we call it a date? An older couple waiting for someone with crosswords. Couples on the way home with stragglers hoping the coffee would get them there. Wonderful. Shamrita again. Yeah, you'll have to unmute. Yeah. Am I audible now, Jagita? Yes. Sure, okay. please. So uh, the one which I will read now, um, Prasad's referred to this uh, during his opening deliberations. This one's called Just Reality. And will you marry her and make her an honest woman? Asked the judge of the rapist. She felt violated all over again. The judge felt no remorse. After all, rape was allowed in marriage and he could do what he wanted and she have the position of a wife. Win-win all around. Humanity drowned in blood, torn to shreds by barbarity. No, said the rapist's lawyer, my lord, now it would be bigamy. He would have loved to marry her then. Now he's, mar he's a married man with children. How can he marry his prey of earlier times. Yes, thought the judge, he has another woman now to rape. This is fate. Young woman, you were at the wrong place at the wrong time, tempted him too early in life, a little later, and you could have been his wife. He is a respectable man. Won't it be best to reach a settlement, make him pay for his act, he said? and laughed at his own joke. And um, I'll conclude with a poem that, that uh, it actually still has me thinking, which is, which is really what I feel good poetry does. It stays with you long after the book is back on the shelf. This one is called Growing With Fate. This is on page 66. We are all born sentenced to life. 
Sometimes we want it commuted to death. We float down the river, rowing with fate. We are all born sentenced to life. Sometimes we want it commuted to death. We float down the river of life with what floats down with us till rivers die, hills disappear, forests burn. We curse fate. In a traveling cage, we share at times with others. We think we are on what could have been great journeys, if only it were our fate. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. This piece to our ears. Over to Shaptaparna, please. This poem has a very interesting title, and so is the content that follows. It's called Edible Woman. Shall I call you my crisp samosa, my alu parantha or masala dosa, Delhi wafers or my alu tikki, alu chart or urulai bhaji? I mean to say I can snack on you anytime and time and again, you're so maddening, lovable, desirable and incredible and clog my arteries and my heart beats so rapidly, frantically trying to find normal in a world that is you. You stop my heart. You jumpstart my life. You're so stunningly addictive, attractive. I can see nothing but you. My jangari, my halwa, my barfi, my desi ghee, besan, laddu. <laughs> the last one that I will be reading, of course, I cannot resist the temptation of uh, reading this out, though Sir has already uh, read out this. It is called Poetry. Why does poetry make so much sense to me when I never know what the poets mean? Why does poetry give me so much energy when it takes so much effort to read? Thank you very much. Thank you, Shaftaparna. Over to Nishi for a question and answer session. Uh, that, was, that was really wonderful. Enjoyed all the readings. It's been a uh, pleasure uh, to listen to Shamrita and to Shaftaparna. And it's been a wonderful uh, evening listening to uh, all the panelists talk about Prasad's poetry and uh, Prasad also talk as well. And I just there's one comment from Lakshmi Kanan in the chat box, which I would like to just read out in case anyone has missed. And uh, she mentions uh, Prasad's humor. And she says that it ranges from being wry, gentle, only to quickly get naughty. And I think that is a very um, you know, important aspect of the poem. But at the same time, as Lakshmi Kanan notes, uh, it was a pleasure to hear the panelists highlight this without losing sight of the political shades of his poetry. Um, thank you so much for your comment. And uh, she speaks about how this event has allowed all of us to luxuriate in poetry as a creative medium. So uh, I, I really love this idea of the humor that we found. And many of the poems, I haven't read all of the poems, but I have been hearing, uh, listening to the poems this whole evening. And I, I do find that element of the humor which comes through while at the same time making very important uh, political statements about various issues that uh, Prasad has been uh, writing about. So I would once again request everyone in case you have questions, um, please. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, we have one from uh, Shomrita where she um, would like to know about the process of selecting these poems from your anthology, from the body of work you created over 25 years. So if you could tell us something about what made you choose the poems that you selected to, to be part of this anthology. I don't even know how to begin that answer. Uh, it is difficult. It is very difficult. And as people who know me also know that I don't save my poems. I write them, I throw them away, I tear poems up. I must have torn more, uh, more poems than have survived. Uh, I have always done this because I read Wordsworth too early and I thought Wordsworth needed somebody who had torn to tear his poems up before they were published. So, 
<laughs> so it's, it's a bit, you know, it's a reaction to some of the great poets that uh, I just felt, come on. I mean, the great poets and I'm, I'm nothing. And I, my poems should not be lying around for people to read. Uh, you know, I mean, when I myself don't like them. So I used to tear them up. So um, among the poems that are still around, uh, I couldn't, I, I could not put a thematic issue together, except for the fact that I said that uh, I, I react to events around me. I write some personal poetry, but it's always, in a sense, I always thought of myself as a political poet. So, um, and as, as somebody like uh, the All of Women News uh, poem, I, I say you'll you know, either bear, bear the inner heat or learn to throw stones or the other way around, right? So I've thrown stones all my life. Uh, I, I can't bear it. I pick up a stone and throw. And uh, sometimes uh, it, 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 it does its job and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, whenever I felt that the poem simply uh, was an angry reaction, I tried not to include it. I tried not to include it. Wherever I felt that there was something I was doing with language, there was something that was that I had managed to do, maybe compression, maybe ellipses, something I'd managed to do, I included it. So uh, I know it's some points that still slip through, which would read as simply comments uh, rather than a, a kind of poetic reaction. But that was the idea. That this, these are the kind of poems that I was looking at, and, and the others I just chucked. Uh, so they are there. The selection from the previous, uh, sorry, from Mendeley without visa, what I didn't include were poems which are simply language play. Uh, it was humorous, it was fun. I was doing a lot of uh, dramatic monologues in, uh, in, an, in an English which I wanted it, where I wanted to go further than Nissim. Um, and in the way I read Nissim, which is not just to see them as funny poems. Um, but as I said, I was looking at them and somehow they seemed dated to me. So I didn't approve them. I don't think I can say anything further than that. Thank you so much. I'll just read a comment. Uh, Anandolal, Professor Anandolal has joined us and we're so grateful that he's come along and uh, he has a comment. Uh, he congratulates you and uh, then he writes, I had to attend since you've been hiding your poems all these years and I didn't know about them. So uh, I just wanted to read that out because I mean, uh, for most people, you are an academic and a critic, but we do know that you have been writing poems here and there, and it's wonderful to hear about this book. Uh, one more question from Nabunita Shenguptor. Uh, she writes that she finds the titles intriguing uh, in Delhi without a visa and this world of mine. Uh, so she asks if you could talk a little bit about the titles as well. To me, titles are very important point, you know, uh, very, very important. They're very important parts of poems because to me, the title is part of the poem. I need to have a title uh, which will be related to the poem, will help to enhance or, or nuance the poem, not enhance, but to nuance the poem. The same is true of, uh, I guess, the titles of books, but in a sense, the title of In Delhi Without a Visa was an entry point into the book. It is not the title of any poem. The title of the particular poem which has In Delhi Without a Visa line is Desperately Seeking India. But that was too obvious. So I wanted to be, for people to see this as personal, political, political, personal poems that they were reading uh, In Delhi Without a Visa. So that was what it was to think of in displacement of displacements of various kinds, migrations of various kinds. Uh, so including of stories. So that was in Delhi without a visa. This world of mine was, is, is it really, a, it's a way of, I wanted to say uh, that, listen, this is our world. Uh, this is our world for better or worse. It's a world where we found things we like, things we found, play, you know, love, we found acceptance. But this is also a world we, completely, we should be completely uncomfortable in. This is, a, this is a world which we should want to better, we should want to, want to change. But this is our world. This is what we live in. These are the kind of uh, people we are. And so this world of mine 
was almost not about it because I was looking as I read through the poems, I said, what else can I call it? It is about my world. It is about our world. But our world seemed a bit presumptuous, so I made it my world, which seemed less. <laughs> nice. uh, we have uh, Shamaladi raising her hand. Do you want, uh, would you like to ask something or say something? Uh, actually, I, I just wanted to comment that I don't think any other title would be appropriate <laughs> for this collection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, this has been a wonderful evening and we've come to this, to the end of it. I, I don't see any hey. more questions. Excuse me, Nishi. Ash, uh, Can we all raise a copy of the book that we have with us, all of us? Yes, So please, that our please, audience can see what the book has copies, please We have been raise. calling it the world is mine and uh, the book is really protesting they it, the, we are visible the book is not so <laughs> so those of you who have a copy of the book please uh, raise it up a little yes and yeah okay uh, thank you thank now, you Nishi. over yes, to you Nishi. Just, yes i i see another question so i might we might as well take it uh, this is uh, Shruti Das asking, she wants to know whether you write the poem first and the title and then the title or the other way around. Uh, some, it's sometimes the title is part of the poem, the way I think of it, but most often uh, the title comes later. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful evening of poetry, uh, listening to yeah. all our panelists, wonderfully moderated yeah, by Shonjukta Di and uh, uh, listening to the readings by Shomrita and Chapta Purna. Thank you to all of you. I would now ask uh, Joy Leap to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Thank you. I'm, it was a sorry, yeah. Jai Deep, before yeah. you say yeah. thanks, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Let yeah. me. Uh, you know, not in the chat box, but here. Thank you all very, very much for such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful reading of my book. And uh, I really enjoyed the whole session and I learned so much also from it. Thank you. I have to interrupt everyone because there seems to be another uh, question. question. Yes, and this is from thinking. Muradi Prasad, a very old friend of ours. Prasad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Prasad I... to Prasad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he so asked. Just, uh, yes. Do you and this think is that... the very last question we are taking. We cannot yes, take yes. any more questions. <laughs> do, you, do you think that most of our Indian English poets write poems like playing tennis with the net down is his question. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Deep. Yeah. Come in. Yeah, that's a wonderful. Uh, it was a fist of ideas, fist of poetry. And who will say poetry can die? Poetry of the world can never die at all. And it lives in the hearts of people like Professor Prasad and all we are present here. Uh, those who are the panelists, those who read out, uh, recited the poems, and also the audience. And uh, if we look into the audience, many of them are very good published poets as well as great critics of poetry. So I express uh, on behalf of IPPL uh, regards for them and thank you for being with us and thank you for living and longing in poetry. Okay. <laughs> and thank you, Professor Prasad, for giving us an opportunity for, uh, for talking about the book after a long silence as a poet, after a long silence as a poet. And we know because no Indian English poetry can ever be complete with your mammoth work on Indian English poetry or as a critic. But we want to see your next book very soon. And uh, it should not be more than two years. It, we, let's talk about very practical things. So we are waiting for that and IPPL platform will wait for your next collection very soon. We thank the our, our honorable chair to our uh, EC Executive Council, Professor Shangjukta Dashgupta. And uh, under her mentorship, we have been
trying to uh, bring that poetry at the heart of the nation. Thank you, Shangjuktadi, for everything. Thank you. That you thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our uh, dynamic care secretary, Dr. Nishi Pulagurtha, for wholehearted contribution for the upload, uplifting the flag of poetry and flag of IPPL to be the destination of Indian English poetry and poetry criticism housed in Kolkata. Thank you, Nishi. More power to you. More power to all the EC members and advisory board members of IPPL. And we are very proud that uh, Professor GJP Prasad has given his consent and joined our uh, team. And we are more powerful, GJP Sahib, with you on board. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shamla Narayan. Um, we learned a lot from her over so many years. And uh, Shamla Di means a lot to Indian writing in English. And her insightful comments will leave for us forever, leave with us forever. And thank you, uh, uh, Anjum. A uh, very insightful art is cunning. And relating art to cunning to the uh, topical, uh, topical nature and I thought contemporary uh, vibes in GJV Prasad's works and relating to world poetry scenario these days. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Asad Dinda and uh, wonderful, and you are not here, you are in a remote part of Assam, still then you were part of it and you uh, encouraged us and you <laughs> took an active part in the discussion and you brought in the limelight to some important issues of Professor Prasad's uh, poetry. And, uh, you know, we can uh, really take back those uh, strings to look at Prasad's poetry for further uh, criticism on uh, Prasad's poetry to further direction. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, our two very talented, uh, people who recited uh, Professor Prasad and took and read his poems so seriously. And I'm very glad both of them liked uh, Prasad's poetry so much, read them again and again, and both of them were involved uh, uh, readers, I will say, and they recited from their heart. And it means that uh, they studied uh, the poems so well and recited to the perfection. And the, mig the evening uh, is really wonderful, a part of which came from their readings. They really read the poems so well. So thank you again, Anjum Di, uh, Shamlanar, Professor Shamlanar, and Professor J.B. Prasad, Shangjuk Tadi as chair, and Professor Asal Din for wonderful evening of poetry, living and longing and poet poetry. Thank you, beautiful audience. You know, uh, we can enlist them and they were so attentive and they didn't leave their place now. So I hope uh, we will connect each other once again by means of poetry, past Indian English poetry, past, present and future. We had with us in the series, uh, Mamangdai, Rabina Sangam, Keki Daruwala, Bashavi Prezer, and uh, so many very talented poets, soul makers. And today's session is one of the, those gems we'll cherish in the days to come. Thank you everybody for their support. Poster designing, Amit, for designing the poster, media, uh, cell, and all involved for making this a possibility. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.